Um, and now we'll begin the panel discussion. And we have the lights from the front, and uh, please, the speakers, can you come to the stage, please? Thank you. for all your very uh, rigorous and intense uh, topics. Um, I guess, um, you know, as we talk about this concept of, of, of abstraction, every local art scene has their own, uh, artists have their own intentions and all their own um, sort of point of departure. And I think one thing that kind of struck me throughout these talks is this um, longing to return to, let's say, you know, in the Korean mo uh, monochrome uh, example, return to the origin, or return to tradition and I think for the calligraphers in Japan also looking at Jomo uh, sculpture and for the artists in Taiwan looking at uh, literati paintings or, or as a rejection or as a form of continuation just going back to a some, somehow a traditional um, concept and a tradition and I think in America too um, something to go beyond the sort of the, the obvious and go to something that's metaphysics or return to um, kind of uh, looking at nature. Um, I, I'm wondering if you all can sort of comment a little bit on this um, impulse to go back to something, to return to something. What What is the sort of, um, how, how does that relate to, um, how, how do artists sort of imagine this abstract through this return to something? very much the new world and interested in going forward up to this point and being the most capitalist, the most um, modernist. This is one place where the term post-war really does kick in. And so whereas the official mm, discussion about post-war, the government, the critics, the promoters, is how great it is that this is the new American century, the artists were almost all horrified by World War II and specifically the rationalization of the concentration camps, and then um, Hiroshima. And um, so the po term post-war was very different for them. And so they have had a strong feeling ag against modernism in many ways, although it's very conflicted. And so the looking backwards is um, what America has no tradition, unlike um, China and all the countries we've heard about today, which have this very sophisticated um, national tradition of art and philosophy in America. We don't have that. We just have sort of European imitations in the real academies. So to go back to tradition means taking someone else's tradition usually, and so therefore the indigenous the interest in indigenous peoples, the Northwest Coast Indians, um, and various archaizing sort of um, interest in, in um, the Egyptian pre prehistoric countries. So the going the abstract expressionism, the artists we think of as abstract expressions, the surfaces have a lot in common with the um, the danse that we just saw, and that sort of very weathered, old-looking texture. Um, there's nothing, there's a lot about it that's not new, and I think that's such an important topic that's been very little recognized, as opposed to either pop in the 50s or um, earlier European modernism, which is very mechanistic and smooth, smooth finished. So that's going back in the years. Mm. To talk about going back to the origin, uh, you related it with the tradition. And uh, and also, as we saw today, uh, thinking about the tradition is kind of essentialism, uh, which is also provocative, but at the same time, uh, very dangerous. Uh, so uh, these critics and dance core artists, probably they, they know that as well. But there was no alternative to avoid the tradition as well. If they knew about alternative, they could find something else. 
And uh, because of this reason, uh, since they are connecting the color of a white, even Danseng means a single color, uh, with the uh, surface of a white porcelain and Goro Dynasty's Celadon surface, they knew it's a danger, but there was no alternative. And the revisionist uh, art historians, and also at the same time, Minju artists, uh, as you can, uh, if you know about Korean art in the 70s, we have two layers. One is uh, Dan Sekwa artist, and then the other one is a more descendant uh, uh, Minju artist. So it's a po the latter was a politically very involved, I can say socially engaged art. So it's like uh, the same, they existed uh, together, but it's almost like uh, oil and water. It is a mix of two different layers, but it's uh, the same era. So uh, Minjun uh, artists or uh, uh, revisionist historians or leftists usually criticize the historicism of these Dan Sekwa critics because uh, thinking about white with the Korean identity, we uh, some historians uh, think that they are formed during the colonial period. Uh, from 1910 through 1945 was a uh, Korea's colonial period. So, uh, and the, in in their argument, uh, there is a Japanese uh, art historian called Yanagi uh, Muneyoshi. Uh, he's called Yanagi Muneyoshi in Korea, but in Japan, he's called Yanagi Suet, uh, following Chinese pronunciation. So, Yanagi Muneyoshi is uh, Minye. In Korea, we say Minye. The art of people in Japan is it is a sad uh, Minye. So uh, Yanagi Muneyoshi came to Korea to establish a uh, Minye Museum. Later on, he translated the Minye as folk art museum, folk art movement. But strictly speaking, uh, Minye is not folk art movement because it is a collection of a Minye. There was also white porcelain. As you know, white porcelain is not for middle class people. It was a literati, it was an elitist, it was a, for royal people. So it's very controversial. So this is because of, uh, because we had colonial period, and also during this colonial period, the color of a white uh, was considered uh, very Korean, uh, which was promoted by uh, Yanagi Muneyoshi. He wrote uh, several articles on Korean craft. Uh, but but this is uh, it's hard to criticize because you know uh, whenever we think of what is very Korean, <laughs> who can answer it without thinking about white color or Korea dynasty uh, the uh, white porcelain? So uh, I I try to be very cautious about this kind of criticism. Then I try to read uh, EE's primary sources. Then found that uh, they try to moving forward for modernity, like uh, uh, like a Western concept of modernity, uh, like modernism. Then they are looking back. It's almost like up the genus face. Like uh, it's almost like interlocking the middle, but one looking forward the other looking backward. And I think this is a dilemma, but they, at the same time, this is the identity of Korean Dan Sekwa. Thank you. Um, in my presentation, I discussed uh, the issue of tradition, but of course, uh, this is not a, a major uh, movement uh, in post war Japan. Uh, of course, many of the artists uh, interested in something new, like uh, art formal or action painting or other. So uh, I just uh, focusing on uh, the situation uh, in the calligraphy world and in relation to uh, the traditional debate uh, by architects and also uh, Okamoto Taro's interest in tradition. And uh, I think uh, Tange and Okamoto, the interest is not is not the return to the origin or return to the, the tradition. It's more like a kind of a, mm, uh, it's a free interpretation or a kind of deconstructive approach to the tradition because uh, they don't uh, do kind of uh, uh, histo historically accurate. <laughs> Research. They just uh, uh, using uh, 
tried the idea of tradition as a concept. So, uh, yes, so that's what uh, I want to ex uh, emphasize in my uh, presentation. And also, uh, 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 about the, as for the abstraction, issue of abstraction, uh, in, in possible ja Japan, uh, abstraction is not a uh, um, good word to, to represent uh, the newest uh, issue. Abstraction uh, basically used in the 1930s, I think, 20s and 30s. So it's a kind of a dated word. So uh, of course, uh, there are a couple of uh, Articles, no, uh, many articles uh, using the word abstract painting or abstraction, but uh, people usually use like a uh, art association or action painting, and uh, so uh, younger artists uh, didn't use the words. Okay, uh, thank you. In the uh, context of Taiwanese art, ink art, on tradition. Uh, we have to sort of go back to uh, uh, late 19th and early 20th century to see this as a continuation, not, not just as a Taiwan, but as a sort of Chinese uh, continuation of resolving Chinese crisis uh, under the colonial uh, condition. Uh, and uh, for the first time in Chinese culture, uh, China was behind Japan, and China was crushed by the West. And so this notion of crisis was very, very uh, present uh, in the minds of all the intellectuals uh, of China. And so essentialism then became important. And then, of course, of course it was also uh, found by uh, Japanese uh, and Asian. And so in the post-war era, that in part continued uh, to uh, I have a question uh, for uh, I. Um, I, I was wondering how for no no uh, how uh, artists in Taiwan knew about 
uh, Western uh, Western contemporary art or Japanese contemporary art. So how far uh, Japanese art was known in Taiwan in the 40s and 50s and 60s? Uh, in the 40s, it was still under the colonial rule uh, up until the uh, until 1945. Uh, so there was that direct uh, contact with the uh, with Japanese. Uh, there was no power. Uh, in the post-war era, uh, there was still uh, a fair number of Japanese artists in Taiwan. Uh, uh, then they had dialogue. With them. But uh, we're talking about into the mid 50s, uh, mid 50s and early 60s. Uh, there was already a very strong uh, anti-Japanese sentiment uh, in Taiwan. And so the, the competition between China and Japan in the pre-war uh, era sort of was a carryover uh, in, in, sort of in, that, in that context. Um, and also during this time, uh, American government had uh, established American Cultural Center uh, in Taipei. Uh, and uh, there were a uh, fair number of uh, uh, magazines uh, there that uh, uh, people, artists who lived in Taipei would go to these, uh, uh, go to this place to uh, uh, read the magazines, even though they couldn't understand uh, English, but they could look at the pictures. Uh, and, uh, uh, and very quickly, I think, uh, they were inspired. And so a lot of times these kind of transmission of ideas uh, is carried over with some kind of uh, misunderstanding, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it's, it's a form of uh, uh, regeneration of new ideas. Uh, I think that happens uh, in the East as well as in the West. Uh, so to answer your question, I think uh, there was more American influence than Japanese influence uh, in the abstract art movement. Thank you. And actually, uh, in Japan too, um, American people, uh, uh, no, uh, allied forces, uh, most of them are American, uh, made uh, American cultural center and uh, uh, libraries. So uh, uh, many uh, Japanese artists uh, learned uh, uh, American and European uh, from uh, those institutions. And the uh, funny thing is that uh, uh, Yoshiwa Najiro, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the leader of Budai Art Association, uh, reviewed, uh, no, no, uh, he wrote an article on American painting uh, when he, when he uh, discussed about Macross painting. Of course, he didn't see the actual paintings. He just saw those kind of paintings in black and white. So he, he wrote, uh, I don't know the color, but this is good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, always there's a misunderstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, artists can be uh, irresponsible sometimes. They don't have to take, take, take uh, you know, translate it, translating so, so seriously. Um, does a similar thing happen in Korea as well? Artists, um, what, what sort of sources do they have from, let's say, Europe or, or America? Uh, he actually studied at Sorbonne, so he's uh, very well aware of what was going on in uh, France and also in America. And uh, he translated uh, several books from French into uh, English. And, uh, uh, and also, but this is a uh, uh, very interesting. Although sometimes the artists uh, don't like to agree by whom they are influenced, by and also what they saw. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, I saw actually after this uh, AG exhibition, uh, I was uh, telling Genji that uh, I could not find the first name, but the last name. But in Korean, uh, Hongi newspaper, it was a publication. He uh, translated uh, from. Uh, uh, Japanese into Korean. So that article originally was published in Bijutsu uh, Techo, uh, the very popular art magazine in Japan. So it means that uh, artists knew about, uh, they, they read a uh, Japanese magazine, which this is very, very uh, famous actually in contemporary art. So, uh, and 
and also during this time, uh, Korea had a very close relationship, uh, and uh, the, the Korean artists participated in Sao Paulo Biennial and also Paris Biennial. So they had uh, several sources uh, from outside as well. So it's interesting that sort of you know in, in the three countries we're talking about, uh, the outside sources that came in are sort of, in, if I could say, branded in the kind of abstract art that's supposed to be you know the current of the time. But as Katie's paper has told us, you know this kind of branding is really rejected by artists who are uh, in the midst of it, um, and it's there's a lot of. Um, sort of other strands and other currents that, that are flourishing at the time that may not be so easy to be branded. Um, and of course, exhibitions and museums have some sort of um, uh, impulse or in agenda in terms of shaping it that way. And I think our talk sort of, uh, this kind of scene kind of un unexpectedly kind of came out. Um, do you have other questions for each other? I actually had a question for everybody or anybody who wanted to answer. This is because it's called post-war abstraction. What we mostly see today is um, abstract painting, and um, you know, with some exceptions like the intermedia um, modernism that Kenji presented. I was curious, mostly easel painting. You know, that sort of traditional size, and that's something that the U.S. artists were really struggling with wanting to get away from easel painting or make it something bigger or something that was architectural to get away from this part of the tradition they didn't like. And, and so I wondered how central was this, like your ink art versus ink painting? You know, how central was this idea of this kind of paint on canvas? And, and was it seen as a, a Western idea or something you know, from the outside? I wondered about what kind of role that played in these various uh, that is a very good question because in the West, uh, it's uh, slowly postmodern thoughts are coming into life, right? From late 60s, from 70s. And actually, when I show the AG, it's very part of the AG uh, uh, pages. And I could uh, see a lot of experimental art uh, uh, I installations and also um, very uh, a lot of conceptual uh, uh, artworks were introduced in this uh, just the four issues of avant-garde, and because uh, the first the Korean performance was uh, uh, played in 1967, and uh, installation pieces were introduced in the 70s as well, but it was not persistent, uh, consistent. But painting was very very consistent and very gener uh, generationally interlocked. And also, uh, unlike the West, uh, uh, Korean painters were professors, and they are teaching uh, at school. So uh, there are several departments, uh, and uh, still we we say that the department of painting is like uh, the uh, central, very very important department because we're thinking about the category of fine art, which was introduced uh, to Korea after the war. Uh, Korean studio art programs was uh, established after the war, uh, uh, basically. So, mm, can I end? Do, do I answer your question? Um, it depends, of course. Uh, uh, many artists uh, regarded uh, either painting as a Western yeah, uh, <coughs> tool, of course. And uh, um, I think. Uh, hmm. I think it it was uh, in the early 60s that uh, some of uh, some of the younger artists uh, criticizing and uh, uh, criticizing and rejecting is a uh, painting. Uh, not only is but also uh, canvas or oil paint. So. That, that's how uh, uh, performance art and uh, uh, performance art um, kind of uh, I say, uh, uh, performance and junk art uh, started in the early 60s. I think uh, that was a, a response, a rejection to the easy painting. So, uh, of course, uh, there are many artists uh, who uh, use, who still use use 
is a painting, of course, uh, because uh, um, if you uh, want to enter the art universities, you have to uh, practice uh, with uh, drawing, with, uh, so, um, so, and uh, there are not so many avant-garde artists, of course. <laughs> so, uh, yes, most of the uh, painters using use uh, easel, but uh, uh, there are some artists who reject it. Uh, to uh, add uh, briefly, but these avant-garde uh, experimental artists uh, uh, published or included in AG, we also had a group called ST. <laughs> the, it means space and time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they are evaluated now in Korea uh, by uh, galleries and museums. I think especially in the late 60s and 70s, Lee Sung Tak's sculpture is really amazing. And also Kim Gu Rim's early film work and also his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, work was included in avant-garde AZ uh, magazine as well. It's wonderful. I think that they, they, they had a retrospective exhibition uh, last year and uh, represented by uh, now prestigious galleries. So now they are really importantly uh, evaluated and considered. <coughs> I was interested, you know, Kenji, especially because, you know, the American artists are rejecting painting later too to make performances. But you were talking about your time earlier, and and that they were pushed by a, the European promoter to make paintings and to sort of restrain that impulse to to work in different ways. So I wonder if it's something more than just going beyond painting, but if it's easel painting and specifically European. Uh, uh, before that, I, I like to uh, add one thing. Um, Japanese artists, of course, uh, made uh, uh, made uh, larger paintings uh, in the late fifties and sixties, uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> Japanese houses are very small, so <laughs> <laughs> they, they they have to uh, divide a painting into several parts. So uh, there are a lot of paintings. Uh, that can be uh, divided into several parts, like uh, Tsukawa South, uh, Ingen Kikao, uh, yes. And uh, about the um, Thai artists, uh, of course, uh, they uh, start. Uh, the the uh, Thai Art Association was established in 1954, and uh, in the early period, uh, they are more interested in uh, performance and uh, installation and kind of uh, time-based art. Uh, but uh, in 1956, uh, there was a big exhibition uh, showing unformal paintings. Uh, Japanese artists are really interested in uh, unformal paintings. And, and the next year, in 1957, uh, Michel Tapie came to Japan and um, giving uh, advices uh, to uh, artists, including Gutai artists. So uh, that's why uh, Gutai artists uh, changed uh, their styles uh, more uh, to into paintings, because uh, according to Tapie, uh, paintings are uh, portable and uh, can be exported to fr uh, France and other countries and uh, of course they can sell. Uh, but, um, but still, of course, uh, Shiraga Kazuo uh, paint uh, his food paintings uh, uh, putting his canvas on the floor, which is totally different from uh, the Western style uh, uh, painting. So, uh, mm. so, uh, what is it? I'm, I'm saying. <laughs> and so, uh, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, but, of course, uh, as for the good eye, uh, people often say that uh, because they uh, 
they they cease to uh, they stop they stop making performance and installation and turn to uh, painting. But uh, this interscholastic uh, has a different idea. Um, if you uh, look uh, close, if you uh, take a close look at uh, what a good artist wrote, uh, they often use the word e, meaning picture, or some scholars uh, translate it picturing. So, uh, which is totally different from kaiga or painting. Because uh, uh, kaiga uh, is a very Western notion. Uh, it, it's a kind of translation of uh, the Western word painting. But uh, Kutai artists are interested in e. E, e is, uh, of course, a traditional word uh, meaning picture. And also, uh, when uh, you are a child, you first, uh, one of the first things uh, children uh, do is uh, making a drawing. So uh, in Japan, we, we say e o kaku or oikaki, uh, meaning uh, uh, making picture. So uh, and the thing is that uh, the, the word e includes not only paintings but also uh, performance and installation uh, in in the. Uh, good artists are learning. So that's really interesting. <coughs> uh, there were other uh, groups other than other developments other than I think art uh, in Taiwan uh, in, in the post-world era. Um, and uh, I think there's been a book written by uh, uh, Lai Yinin on the mixed media uh, uh, movements in Taiwan. There's several groups um, that were active during the time. And uh, an artist like uh, Yo Yo Yang, Yang Yin Kong, uh, who, uh, who was interested in modern uh, sculpture, uh, uh, who, who actually made a fame um, uh, for himself uh, in his uh, uh, stainless steel um, uh, sculpture. All over the place. And then in the uh, early 1970s, uh, because of the uh, uh, international uh, political situation change, uh, there was a strong uh, push uh, to uh, reject uh, Western modernism and abstraction uh, and return to Taiwan uh, uh, in, the, in the sort of nostalgic uh, uh, sentiment uh, to look at. Uh, we call this Xiangtu. Uh, which can, can be translated as a nostalgic localism uh, to look at uh, uh, not to the west but coming back to uh, to the soil to look for something that's closer to us uh, and so that was a, a very strong movement uh, in the 19, early 1970s uh, that changed uh, the uh, dynamics of uh, art uh, in the I think um, for, if, if I may, um, for Nobo Song, his paintings are mostly uh, done to from classic as as Chinese paintings usually are. But um, I guess the sort of tradition that he's he's um, most sort of detesting is this, you know, the, the ink painting tradition. But he still sometimes put his paintings on a scroll format, like hanging scrolls. Um, and but Zhangzhe, on the other hand, is not. Pan has shown um, he was using oil on try, trying oil and ink on paper or on canvas, you know, but the medium kind of is interchangeable. Um, so, sort of in terms of formatting, he, he preferred them framed in sort of what's I can say it is a Western way rather than putting it um, on a hanging scroll or a hand scroll sort of format. So, that takes out that sort of traditional reading. But a lot of sort of modern, the modernist um, ink painters at the time still adhere to that sort of uh, the, the more traditional way of reading a painting or infusing the element of time into their, their view. Uh, I have a question uh, to Katie. 
Uh, of course, uh, it's uh, very difficult to discuss the uh, issue of influence, but uh, could, could you tell me or tell us about how uh, American artists uh, were influenced by uh, Asian art? I mean, in, I guess in, a, in, the, in d varying degrees and varying degrees of rigor, mostly pretty sloppy, well-meaning, you know, but sl sloppy, uh, as artists tend, tend to be, and maybe Americans too, that, that they're looking, you know, very broadly for something else. Because like I was saying, it, it had all gotten pretty crummy, you know, the European tradition, they were really, really just wanting to push themselves away from the, um, you know, as the root of World War II. So they were looking looking very broadly. And some of them were quite serious about it. Franz Klein was not looking at it. <laughs> Ink painting, despite the fact that there's this, this very, what seems like a very obvious homology. But Mark Toby was, was quite interested. Um, and all of them were aware of it. They're mostly living in New York, and they are, they are going to the Metropolitan. Um, although they're more, also more interested in the Museum of Natural History than the fine, than the, than the fine arts tradition. Um, but then um, I think even maybe even more broadly in the second generation of abstract painters in the 50s, people are, are looking and beginning to also go to Asia as that becomes more and more possible. So Richard Tuttle, very interested, that work is very important for him. Printmaking, um, later married to a, a Chinese-American poet, and, and throughout his life making frequent trips to Asia, Agnes Martin, um, but, but most broadly of all, um, interested in, in Asian philosophy and religion in a very popularized form. And um, Su Suzuki, and influential lectures in New, in New York, but even more popularized by John Cage, um, Alan Watts, intellectual popularizers, um, and again to very varying degrees. You know, Alex Martin quite serious, John Cage quite serious, Robert Rauschenberg in his very enthusiastic <laughs> um, way, but maybe less rigorous and more just taking the look of things. So I think it's something you'd have to ask sort of artist by artist, but in a, in a very general way, um, people are really looking looking in that direction. And maybe even you would even, some, a scholar who's focused on the West Coast would even answer that differently, saying you know, as part of being part of the Pacific Rim, there's a more serious engagement of Morris Graves, and, um, and this is Mark Toby too, part of the, the Northwest sort of branch of um, what we think of as abstract expressions. There, there's a lot of work that remains to be done there. Um, well, I think we should probably open it up to the uh, audience members, as I hope that you have burning questions for our speakers. And if you do, please raise your hand, and we have a microphone for you. Oh, yes. So visually speaking, uh, for uh, compared to like uh, Taiwanese ink painting, like uh, which is influenced by sand, that you can see a lot of automatic and uh, spontaneous action in the painting. But uh, for Korean artists like uh, Kim Jong Yu, uh, Yu Fan, uh, Park Seo Bu, they are more like having like a repetitive pattern, like the water drops. And I'm wondering if there is any, uh, for these kind of artists, like a Korean uh, monochrome artist uh, or abstract artist, do you think these kind of repetitive pattern are found in their abstract art is related to their own cultural root? Uh, it, it is a very good point. Actually, they emphasize also repetition. If uh, you read uh, their writing and also contemporary cr uh, critical writings, 
but also if they say uh, repetition and very performative, and uh, uh, the, their own bodies are very involved. And uh, probably they um, they did not say calligraphy or like a Thai, like a Taiwanese case, but uh, I think it, it I, I think that is kind of cultural DNA. <laughs> uh, although calligraphy was uh, I, unlike Japan, it was in my program. I thought uh, as a uh, as I listened to Candy's talk. What's going on Korean calligraphy? I have never seen any students who are doing calligraphy. So, uh, but probably, but when, when we are very little, also calligraphy is very important. Now we are all doing typing, but uh, uh, calligraphy, there was a class to learn calligraphy when I was uh, a little. So, uh, although they do not connect with the calligraphy, but they, they do emphasize with their own physical involvement and very repetitive, uh, 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 they do not say pattern, but uh, materiality. And I think um, that's why if you see that there are titles, it's really like a serial number. It's kind of barcode. And uh, so you can easily find out the when it was made because they put serial number. And uh, yeah. Uh, the same kind of movement actually happened in Taiwan much later. Uh, in fact, it happened around the time uh, when the uh, Tiger Guards movement was established uh, in the early 1980s. Owing to many two people who uh, uh, went overseas to study and went back to Taiwan, they thought they brought back the most advanced Western art they were going to promote in Taiwan. One was Zhuang Bu and the other was Lai Chun Chu. Uh, but in the early 1980s, Taiwan was already began to change and changing very fast. And so initially this group had the uh, upper hand uh, in uh, getting uh, exhibition spaces uh, in, uh, uh, in Taipei Fine Arts Museum. And then uh, the indigenous movement came about uh, the Taipei uh, Taipei Painting School uh, then began to compete with uh, this uh, group. So there was that tension between a native born uh, art group versus this uh, uh, foreign uh, annihilating uh, painting school abstract versus realism again uh, that happened in Taiwan. Just uh, uh, he, uh, uh, one thing <laughs> reminded me of um, at Chan. Uh, in Korea, we say San. And uh, the uh, chance effect is, of course, uh, emphasized in Dan Sekwa artists because they, they don't, uh, especially if you see Ha Zhong Hyun's work, he does not paint. He puts paint on the back part of the canvas, so he puts them down. So uh, the, it, it, it depends on uh, chance effect and uh, time. So it has uh, the texture coming uh, from the canvas. The clothes, canvas clo uh, the clothes. So, um, but it's not, they, they do not say uh, Jen uh, or Sun in Korean, but uh, but it's also related to kind of a long time, almost like a meditating. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, thanks so much for your presentations. Um, I actually had a question um, related more towards the, the ideas of um, the, the collections themselves um, and where these works are actually located. Um, I've just noticed more that the, the works, especially for Korean monochrome and also for Taiwanese uh, kind of ink and modern, they've been, there's a lot more demand for them. There's a lot more kind of activity collecting these works just in the past you know, year or two. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's some kind of correlation in terms of these works coming out, more uh, kind of research, more information about it, or it's also related to the collections themselves. I mean, do you notice anything from your, your kind of vantage point? Thank you, Jay. <laughs> well, uh, I live in the United States, so I, I 
don't usually follow uh, what's happening on the market. Uh, and I don't have the uh, uh, ability uh, from so far away to actually uh, notice this uh, on a daily basis. Yeah. But it's interesting, interesting uh, to see that's say, happening. Uh, it's funny, but I'll just say super briefly that in the United States it's happening, you know, like crazy, driven by the galleries. So Mono Hot, you know, two years ago, and now Don't Say Quad, there were two big shows at galleries in, in New York. And so, um, I don't know, the market's expanding in the, in the U.S. as well. Um, last year, when I organized a very small collection from Yi um in the 60s or 70s, uh, sometimes uh, artists exchange the works together. And then, uh, fortunately enough, uh, Yi-il's descendants did not sell them. So they kept everything because the father left uh, something as a souvenir. But sometimes we joke that uh, you leave those works to uh, the son, it's going to be disappeared. Uh, the uh, daughter-in-law will sell them everything. <laughs> 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 the girl will, uh, uh, will keep everything. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a very interesting um, uh, experience because uh, Kim Chang Yeol's work, uh, early his early works, he's uh, very famous for water drops, but they are painted on uh, a newspaper, like a Western uh, Le Figaro or uh, um, Financial Times, but that is very rare. So some collectors came to the uh, opening and said they really uh, want to buy the early piece, but uh, the, uh, the daughter who owns that piece, it, it, she doesn't want to sell any of them. So uh, so I could feel it's really like getting popular even in Korea, but uh, even uh, then, uh, it was not as popular now. I, I think uh, last uh, spring there was a freeze auction in New York, and uh, one of the artists uh, who I showed here is almost like uh, I was told it was sold out. So. Um, so, it, but it, it took really such a long time to get a uh, global perspective because for a long time, uh, they are highly appreciated inside Korea, but uh, never uh, uh, outside Korea. So it, it, I think it took time. And also maybe I thought that it's uh, something to do with the uh, um, Korean uh, awareness of uh, Korean art. Uh, when I went to the USA in 1995, and Back then, actually, I worked in a gallery in New York. Then um, Chinese artists were not the famous either. <laughs> so, but then uh, five years later, they are showing works here and there. They are one of the busiest men I have seen. And uh, but still, uh, Korean art was not uh, garnering a lot of critical attention. And um, then uh, uh, Korean economy was booming so that a lot of Korean galleries uh, represented these dance choir artists and also EU1 was represented by American uh, gallery, Pace Wittgenstein, Pace Gallery. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know I answer your question, but uh, it's, uh, it's that is uh, something beyond that I can answer. It's an uh, economic uh, uh, question as well. Um, of course, maybe uh, you may know that the uh, diet and uh, monohard were purchased uh, by collectors in America. So uh, I think uh, most of the major works are already <laughs> possessed uh, by uh, somebody. And uh, of course, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Japanese uh, museums in Japan uh, began to collect uh, possible art uh, in the late 70s and uh, of course uh, in the 80s uh, Japan's economy was very good so uh, I think uh, uh, many um, museums in Japan uh, purchased uh, some of the some of the works so um, yes <laughs> but uh, actually I'm not sure about the market <laughs> I'm sorry I, I I also think that this kind of conference promotes uh, dance <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I don't know, it's good. Uh, 
Um, oh, one more question. There's one up here. I guess this is our last question. And we can have conversations outside. Um, uh, earlier we touched on automatism and uh, you had spoken about how in America there were aspects of Asian philosophy which have caught people's imagination. In Korea we've been told that there's a sense of order as much as anything else. Um, I was wondering if one went back to artists like uh, BCA or Michaud who did look at Asian art as an inspiration for working on uh, producing works through gesture and automatism. And perhaps in China we have Qin Fang, in Hong Kong we had Ari Yu Zhao. Um, how far do you think that this, this idea of uh, automatism in the way in which an artist works can be linked to abstraction in Japan or South Korea or Taiwan or Asia generally? Well, in uh, uh, Li Zhongshan's teaching, uh, he specifically taught his students to hold the brush, but but not necessarily focusing on transmitting the form that he sees through careful representational uh, uh, expression, but letting the brush or the, the pen uh, to go by itself, so sort of in, in an intuitive way uh, to let it happen. Uh, and to see how the mind uh, and the external world will meet in the end. Uh, and so, in a way, it, it has some emphasize some kind of control, but not necessarily a full control uh, of the artist's uh, brush. Uh, and so that, that's Li Zhongshen's uh, um, uh, viewpoint in terms of how uh, this process should, should happen. Now, in, in uh, in the Obo Song's case, and a lot of his followers uh, follow that it's all mostly by chance, uh, depending on how things turn out uh, in the process. Uh, I think one uh, exception is uh, Li Jinyi. Uh, he uh, used a uh, cork to stamp on the uh, uh, paper, and he, he, he draws the grids on the paper, uh, and then carefully uh, stamp these uh, squares, and depending on what he's uh, working on, uh, in the end you can see a portrait or see uh, a landscape, uh, but it's very controlled. Um, um, surrealism uh, was uh, very popular uh, in the early uh, 50s uh, in uh, Japanese art. Uh, so, uh, which is quite different from the situation in America, I think. Uh, but um, I'm not sure uh, how far artists are experimenting, uh, how far artists uh, experimented with uh, the technique of automatism. Uh, automatism. Of course, uh, uh, when you read uh, calligraphers uh, articles, they often emphasized uh, making calligraphic works uh, without uh, making the consciousness uh, working. So uh, it's very close to uh, the issue of automatism. Of course, uh, there are many uh, chances in calligraphic works, and but uh, I'm not sure uh, they are interested in surrealism or. Uh, Automatism, and also uh, I think we can uh, say the same thing uh, about uh, Gutai art. Of course, some of the painting, some of the Gutai paintings uh, uses uh, chance or kind of uh, uh, subconsciousness, but uh, I'm not sure uh, whether and, uh, they are interested in automatism. They uh, tonight exactly say automatism, but uh, when I uh, went through AZ, definitely they talk about Dada and surrealism and automatism. But uh, I don't know how they connect. They connect uh, that automatism to their works. 
but instead of the word they, especially in Ha Zhong Hyun's interview, and uh, he emphasized, I don't know how to translate this word into English. It's like uh, in Italian, like a faniante. It's a buwi in Korea, we say buwi. Buwi, you saw it, right? Faniante. The, is it working? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Do nothing, but if I say in English, you really like a. It's not really do nothing. <laughs> it's like almost, <laughs> yeah. So it's like emptiness. The paradox of emptiness. <laughs> it's uh, so they, they do, it's like do nothing, but it's like a, it's not do nothing. <laughs> and so that that baby is connected. Mm. I would just say that, that automatism is one of those words like abstraction. You can see there's some related idea, and I was thinking that when Anya was talking about Chun and some of the ideas are close, but I can say for the American position that again, it's one of those things that's very specific in each case. It's not, and so that automatism was French and they rejected the attempts of Breton and Mata, the Chilean artist, to sort of have those uh, automatist workshop because they thought it was very authoritarian. And so the American version of it that's related though would be um, risk and intuition and a sort of kinesthetic feeling your way into something. So de Kooning worked with his eyes closed, you know, and so the idea of letting the process and the material rather than your consciousness guide you. And so it's, again, so interesting to see how specific, there's something in the air that these ideas are compelling, but each, it's very culturally specific. Well, with that, um, I would like to thank the speakers for coming to this two-day workshop and symposium and sharing your insights and research with us. And thank you all for coming here on a Saturday afternoon and giving us your time and uh, really precious thoughts. Thank you. And uh, there will be coffee and tea outside waiting for you.